Amy Bakil received her bachelor's degree in mathematics from the University of Southern Maine in the United States. After working in academic assessment, she came to Belgium and earned her MSc in information management at KU Leuven. Her work as a PhD researcher began in September 2012. Her research is focused on survival analysis, investigating its application in different domains and the incorporation of other techniques into the survival analysis models. In her video session, Amy will talk about using survival analysis and social networks for germ prediction in the telco sector. Hello, um, I'm going to, uh, my name is Amy Bacchio and I'm going to do um, a short presentation about an application of analytics, um, which is, uh, this particular application is germ prediction, uh, which you may have heard of. I will um, cover f basically five sections, um, start with an introduction, and in particular, um, I'm looking at two perspectives of churn prediction, or of churn in general, the company perspective and the customer perspective. And then we'll look at some churn prediction models and pay uh, particular attention to um, the difference between the accuracy of the model and the comprehensibility of the model, and why it's important that we have both. Um, then we'll look at the churn prediction process, um, and pretty much this is mostly independent of the, of the model that's chosen. You generally will follow um, one, one process, um, which um, we will go through um, step by step. Um, after that, I will offer some um, possible model evaluation and assessment um, metrics, which can be used to um, decide uh, if your model is appropriate. And finally, I'll wrap things up with a brief conclusion. So um, what is churn prediction? Um, basically, if you want to increase profits, um, one way of doing that is by increasing customers. Um, and that's pretty basic. Um, so you have two ways of doing that. You can recruit new, cu new customers. Um, so you, you look for new ones uh, that don't have your product, and you try to bring them in as customers. The difficulty with this um, is that um, many markets are saturated markets, meaning there are not a lot of people out there with no uh, current customer account with some company, um, whether they're, if they're not with you, they're likely with a competitor. And so drawing them um, in as a brand new customer is nearly impossible, um, but bringing them, uh, taking them away from their current uh, provider is also quite difficult. Um, and because these are difficult, uh, they're, they're also associated with high cost, um, somewhere around five to six times the cost of keeping a current customer. Um, so recruiting new customers is, is difficult, it's costly, um, and it's not always very easy, uh, uh, very possible. So the alternative is to retain the customers that are currently in your, uh, in your company. So um, these have yeah, there are some benefits with retaining customers compared to recruiting new customers. In particular, um, existing customers, yeah, they, co they cost lower uh, to maintain their accounts, and uh, there are loyalty benefits associated with existing customers. And some of those benefits are um, if you, the longer you have a customer with, you, uh, with your company, the less likely they are to leave your company. So it becomes sort of easier to keep them the longer that they're there. Um, in addition, if you have uh, satisfied customers, they're more likely to bring in um, family, friends, other people. They act as word of mouth um, advertising for you, basically free advertising. Uh, that's another benefit of re um, keeping current customers happy with your, with your company. Um, in addition, they usually cost less to serve. Um, they, yeah, there are not all of the um, associations with, uh, with activation, with um, setting up uh, automatic accounts or payments or um, billing situations. Most of the time, everything is pretty uh, smoothly running at this point, um, and so keeping them um, is less expensive. So in general, the idea is that companies should be making uh, dedicated efforts to retaining their existing customers. And if they are trying to recruit new customers, that's, that's great. Um, but in addition to that, they should focus on retaining the ones that they currently have. 
So in order to do that, we look at uh, churn prediction and, and, and knowledge about churn. Um, churn is just leaving a company, basically, um, canceling a service, discontinuing uh, purchase of, of products, um, that, that anything like that could be considered churn. So um, I looked at two perspectives of churn. Um, one is what I call the company perspective. It's things that the company can do themselves, which reduce the number of customers or, or their likelihood of churning. And we call these determinants of churn. Um, these are what, what make customers decide to churn. And this is, um, this is the services that you provide, the, um, yeah, the, the, the customer service, but also the, the products, uh, if they're high quality or the services are high quality, um, if the prices are competitive, all of these things that you do um, for your customers. Um, if you improve the areas that are important to the customers, then they're less likely to leave. I mean, that's, that's pretty, um, pretty expected. Um, as one uh, as one example, a study was done uh, of a, of Korean um, mobile telephone companies, um, and I mean it's 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 very straightforward. The things that customers care about are, are quite obvious. They want uh, high quality calls. They want uh, yeah reasonable tariff levels. Um, they want uh, yeah. Um, overall uh, geographic uh, service areas um, that are you know, convenient to them or, or accessible to them. And so when you do this type of study um, to find the determinants of churn in your industry or in your company, then you identify areas where you can make improvements um, which, are, yeah, m which are appealing to your customers in order to keep more of them. Um, but of course, there may be physical or resource limitations to this. It's not uh, it's not feasible or 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 certainly not easy to continually make your call service quality increase. Um, you can't uh, continually lower costs for customers uh, because you need to also um, yeah cover your costs. So some of these things are not possible or at least not practical to do. Which is why we look at the um, customer perspective of churn. Um, and this is looking at individual customer accounts and um, qualities about those uh, customers that seem to indicate that they're likely to churn. Um, so you're looking for a correlation between um, churn and customer attributes. Um, you, yeah, these can be um, individual uh, um, attributes about the customer, such as um, age or um, yeah, housing status, um, the location where they live, um, any anything about the customer themselves. It can also be behavioral attributes, so the way that they're using the service, how frequently they use the service, the amount of uh, money, yeah, the, the that they generate, um, yeah, either by purchases or or, or by contracts, um, and you look at these uh, these attributes for a, a, a series, a data set of your customers. Um, and based on past churn behavior, you, you identify certain attributes that indicate a customer is likely to churn. Then you use the same model, you use it on your existing customers to predict those with a high probability of churn. These we call high-risk customers. And if you identify high-risk customers, you can uh, target a marketing campaign or retention campaign to try to encourage them to stay. So again, going back to the uh, example of the tel telecom operator, um, if you identify the top 5% of your customers who are likely to leave your company, you can offer them a voucher. If they, uh, if they refill their account for 15 euros, you will give them 5 euro bonus calls uh, valid for one month, something like that. Um, and what that does is not only uh, assuming they accept it. Uh, it generates the revenue from their credit uh, that they purchase, um, minus the, the, the bonus that you offer them. But it also extends their service one month uh, further. So if you can keep them longer, sometimes that's enough to, to stop them from leaving, um, leaving altogether. So next, uh, we will look at churn prediction models. So these are the, um, the techniques or the, the models that you will use um, to actually make these predictions about who are your top 5%, your top 10% likely to, likely to leave. And almost every, uh, every modeling technique has been used 
um, for churn prediction. It's very well studied. Um, so we have examples of decision trees, logistic regression, support vector machines, um, and many others. Um, some are more or less common, more or less known um, publicly. But they've all sort of been, uh, many of them have been adapted to, to churn prediction. Um, so making a decision about which model to use is not always uh, so straightforward. So um, we will look at um, model comprehensibility. Um, and I mentioned in the beginning that there's, it, it's, uh, there's a trade-off between accuracy and comprehensibility. And you really need both of them. Um, accurate models allow precise targeting. So it means that if you have an accurate model and you identify a, high, yeah, a certain percentage of churners, you expect a lot of those that you identified to be actual people who are likely to churn. Um, people who are thinking about churning uh, in the coming in the coming time period. So these are this is obviously important. You don't want to ad identify a bunch of people, send them a marketing campaign, which is going to cost you some money, and these are people who would have stayed no matter what you had done. Um, then you're just the, you're just losing money. You're not uh, you're not keeping any customers because they would have stayed anyway. So you want to accurately predict churners. But you need comprehensibility as well. Um, and so comprehensibility is just the, the ability not only to understand the model itself, but understand why it's making the predictions that it's making. Um, and this usually looks at things like, um, yeah, um, do the, the attributes which indicate a high risk of churn, do those make sense to, to, to us, to people in the company, um, people who have been working in, in marketing or churn campaigns in the past? Um, for instance, um, in the determinants of churn um, study that was done, it was found that um, uh, a high level of call quality is less likely to, um, to, to result in churn. And that makes sense to us um, if, if calls are are high quality, then we will stay with the company. If they're low quality, then we're likely to, f to seek a new, uh, a new contract elsewhere. So um, by having compre comprehensible models, we can, uh, we can have a few things. Um, for instance, domain expert assessment. And this means basically what I was saying. People who are familiar with, um, with churn in the, in the industry or in the company can, can verify that in fact these make sense, um, that these models are, are, are making predictions that, uh, that we would expect, and that we can, we can somewhat trust what they tell us, what the result will be, um, because they, they line up with what, we've, uh, what we know from past experience. They also allow insight into the determinants of churn. So if you can uh, directly link the attributes with the prediction, then you can, you can see what attributes are more important uh, in determining whether or not a, a, a customer will churn. So um, this allows you to look at things from a company perspective, even while you're, uh, you're focusing on the model, which is more of a customer perspective. It allows you to also look at things um, that are yeah, maybe uh, having some impact on your, on your customer base. Um, and they also encourage adoption by business users. So if, if uh, people in the company are already um, accustomed to targeting these, uh, these um, retention campaigns by their own sort of their own experience, their own knowledge, their own understanding of their customers, and they can look at and understand a model which is in line with what they have been previously doing, or at least can be understood um, if it is different, why, why is this uh, attribute particularly important, even if we haven't been using it in the past? If it makes sense, then they're more likely to incorporate that into their, into their work and into their, um, into their daily use. Um, and so if you, if you have a great model which is extremely accurate but nobody understands it, it's very unlikely to be used. Um, so therefore we say, for, for all of these reasons, focusing on comprehensibility um, is very important at least as important as accuracy. So um, I will look briefly at some popular model choices which have been used uh, in companies and also in, uh, in research. Um, one of the most well-known is logistic regression, um, where we just, yeah, we basically build a, a model which links the uh, customer attributes with 
with a with a prediction um, uh, between zero and one, which is just their probability uh, of churn. Um, it's well known and accepted model. Um, it's highly interpretable. And um, the results are quite good, actually, um, even compared to much more complex models. Logistic regression is usually um, as good or better. Um, and so it really leaves, um, yeah, uh, it, 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 it's a very logical first choice um, when you're starting out with building models. And it can also be um, quite helpful if you build a logistic regression model to compare to other models, um, because it sort of gives you a baseline that everyone understands. Decision trees are another option. Um, decision trees are highly interpretable um, and they're um, robust, but uh, in particular, care must be given to class Q, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, decision trees, if they're not uh, if they're not combined with with uh, techniques meant to deal with class Q, they can run into some tr uh, trouble with that. Um, on the yeah, on sort of the opposite side of the spectrum, there are support vector machines or neural networks, um, and both of these are are very accurate uh, prediction uh, models, but they're not easily interpreted. They're considered black box models, and therefore, I think for churn prediction, they're maybe not the best choice, but they are still used, um, and. Uh, some sort of less known, um, but things, uh, models that I've used in my own research. Survival analysis um, is, a, is a regression technique, um, but it focuses a little bit uh, differently. So it is still highly interpretable. Um, in survival analysis, we have something called ha hazard ratio, which uh, shows very, um, yeah, very, in a very straightforward manner, how each uh, attribute impacts the prediction. Um, so that's that's good for survival analysis. And in addition, they offer um, an an additional uh, yeah um, part of information. So instead of just saying yes or no, they're likely to turn or unlikely to turn, we can say with uh, we can say in what uh, amount of time they are likely to turn. So you can look a little bit into the future and see um, who are your sort of immediate customers, who are your midterm customers, and that can also help when you're uh, making decisions about um, the value of a customer to a company. Um, if they're, uh, yeah, if they look, if they appear to be a long, a longer term customer, then um, then you may want to pay particular attention to them. And finally, I will briefly mention uh, rela relational classifiers. This is social network analysis. Um, and this is a way of, rather than looking at a customer's own attributes to make predictions about their churn, we look at who the customer is communicating with and who is in their social network and what the people in the social network are doing. Um, and so this gives us a, sort of a, a different view on the customer. Um, and it's particularly useful in areas where the network is, uh, is yeah, quite important. Um, in churn prediction, for instance, uh, a paper I've uh, worked on, we looked at tel uh, telecom operator, and there, there is a social network. Customers are calling each other, so the network is already there. Um, in addition to that, if uh, if the customers in your network are using the same call operator, then you often have benefits, um, either r free or reduced calling or texting, um, reasons that you would be likely to stay with that customer. Whereas if people in your network are, are leaving the company, they're churning, then you're likely to follow them, um, both because you may receive benefits by moving to a network with them, but also because uh, they're people who influence your behavior. Um, so for that reason, relational classifiers are becoming um, yeah, more and more important as we begin to understand the network, network effects. Uh, and one final thing about, uh, about social network analysis is that um, the, the information we learn from a customer's social network can be used as attributes in some of these other uh, models. So you can actually combine them quite, uh, quite easily, um, and that makes uh, relational classifiers quite interesting. So I will move now into the churn prediction process. 
Um, and I've put it together uh, in, a, in a small diagram here so uh, you can follow. And the steps uh, are numbered, uh, one through eight, um, so you can sort of see how the, how the process moves. Um, in the beginning, we have to define churn. So in some circumstances, this is very straightforward. A customer calls your, uh, your customer service desk and says, I want to cancel my account. Okay, that's very straightforward. Those people are have churned um, because their con their contract is terminated. Um, there, in other circumstances, it's not very straightforward. Um, if it's a prepaid service, for instance, um, and they buy credits at their local store um, to reload their account or or buy them on your website when they need them, then um, they're not going to cancel anything. They're just going to stop buying it. Um, and this is similar when you're talking about a web store um, where customers have been buying things from you and then they stop buying things uh, from, the, from the shop. So, um, the, yeah, so in those cases, it's not so straightforward. There's not a specific date where the, where the contract is terminated. But in that case, we can just say, yeah, if they, uh, if they go a certain length of time without making a purchase or without uh, using a service, then they're, they can be considered churners. Um, so you may say 30 days without making a phone call is a churner. You may say six months without a purchase is a churner. It depends on the context and the circumstances and the type of business that you're talking about. So step one is defining churn. In step two, um, you would separate your, um, your data into yeah, your, your past data, your known data, you would separate it into two sets, a training set and a test set. And the training set uh, you use to build the model, um, which is step three, and the test set is used to evaluate the model, which is step four. And so as step five, we have some model performance. And you can evaluate the model and make sure that it's accurate. Um, and you can use some, we'll talk about some different ways you can assess the accuracy um, or more generally assess the model um, because accuracy is not the only thing we're looking at in that case. Um, once you are satisfied with the, with the model performance, you can use unknown data. This is your, basically your current customer set. You can uh, put that through the model um, in step number six, and you receive predictions about those customers in step number seven. So normally that's going to be a ranking of customers where the most likely to churn are at the top and the least likely to churn are at the bottom. Um, and from these predictions, you can, uh, in step number eight, you can decide who you will send a retention campaign to and who you will not send a ca campaign to. Um, so it may be your top 5%, your top 10%, or you may say anyone over 80% uh, likely to churn, you'll send the campaign to. That's also going to depend on the circumstances that you're dealing with. So those are the, the main steps in any churn prediction process. Um, that, yeah, this, does not, this is not dependent on the model that you choose. Um, so finally, we'll talk about model evaluation. And I want to begin uh, with ClassQ, which I mentioned briefly earlier. Um, basically, you have a lot more non-churners than you have churners in any data set. Um, there are, yeah, if you have, um, if you have if you have a lot of customers churning, then it's uh, maybe um, a unique circumstance where prediction may not be very helpful um, because it's probably a different business context um, where these retention campaigns um, may not make sense anymore. Um, but in general, you will have a lot more non-churners. More, more of your customers stay with you each month or each, um, each time period than the ones who are leaving. Um, so as an example, I. Um, to demonstrate why accuracy is misleading in this case, um, let's say, for instance, you have a small customer set of 100 uh, customers, 90 are non-churners, and 10 are churners. If you build a very, very simple model that just says all customers are non-churners, you will immediately have 90% accuracy. But of course, this is completely useless. If you predict that none of your customers will churn, then you, then you haven't identified any of your customers who who will churn, and you can do nothing to try to prevent that churn. Um, so in this case, what looks like a, yeah, a good accuracy rating, 90%, is in fact completely useless. Um, and so I would say 
that accuracy, while important, um, should not be the sole uh, determinant of whether or not your model is appropriate. Um, instead, in churn prediction, you want to increase the accuracy in predicting specifically the churners, even if that means that you are, um, that you are less accurate in predicting non-churners. Um, because in fact, predicting a non-churner means you do nothing. Um, so you want to focus on the, the minority class, the class of churners. And you can do this in, in several ways. You can oversample churners in your data set or undersample non-churners in your data set to try to get something a little bit more balanced. Um, you can do boosting or use cost sensitive methods which take into account the cost of misclassifying a churner versus the cost of misclassifying a non-churner. Um, and these are some common, um, common, common techniques in classification and prediction that uh, can be used to overcome the class skew. So now I will uh, briefly mention a few evaluation measures. Um, the first one is the ROC curve um, and the associated AUC, which is the area under that ROC curve. Um, and I've put an example here of one such ROC curve. Um, this basically means that uh, you're comparing the number of, um, yeah, the number of true positives versus the number of false positives. Um, so you, each spot on the ROC curve is one, th one cutoff point. Um, it's saying anyone above 90% is a churner, anyone above 80% is a churner, anyone above 40% is a churner. Each one of these points is plotted, um, and you can see um, yeah, how your model performs compared to random, which is the diagonal line in the, in the graph. Um, and at the uh, top left corner of the ROC graph is the point one zero. That basically means, yeah, all are correct and none are incorrect. Um, this would be a perfect classifier. So your your goal should be to have an ROC curve as close as possible to that point one zero. And then area under the curve is is an estimate of of the yeah of the area under that curve. Um, and a AUC is popular because it's a numeric measure, um, and it's more easily compared. Um, we can say with statistical significance whether or not one AUC is uh, different than the other. Um, and so you can, um, you can test uh, mathematically uh, the difference between your models. Um, so that's quite helpful there. Um, in addition, uh, another commonly used is the lift metric, uh, and normally you divide your, um, your predictions into, um, yeah, it can be deciles, it can be, yeah, any, any uh, division of, of customers, and you look at the, the highest um, compared to the overall. So in this case, as just an example, um, I said um, if you had 100 customers in total, back, going back to the previous example, um, and you look at the top 10 customers, the top 10 being those ranked most likely to churn, if five of those 10 customers that you identified are in fact churners, you, you have five out of 10, 50%, and in your original data set you had 10 churners out of 100 customers in total, which is 10%, so your lift metric in this case would be five. And then you can compare your lift metric across the different models to see which one um, does the best at ranking your, your customers. Um, and then finally, um, I added also the expected maximum profit measure, um, which has been tailored specifically to churn prediction, although it's applicable in, in different classification, different prediction techniques. Um, and this basically uses estimates uh, for customer lifetime value, for uh, retention king campaign costs, um, and the distribution for acceptance rate, which is basically whether or not a customer is uh, likely to accept your uh, retention campaign, accept your offer, and continue his or her service. Um, and it uses these estimates to identify um, both an optimal threshold, um, like I said, anyone above 76%, anyone above 94%, things like that. That threshold can be identified and the expected profit at that point can be estimated. So this gives you um, two important, um, yeah, uh, two important measures, both how many customers should be contacted and what you can expect uh, to be your return 
after that contact. Um, and this is, so this is a profit-based measure, and it may be interesting for, custom, uh, for companies to look at this and compare their models based on what ultimately the goal is, is to increase profits. So if we use that in our model selection, um, we may uh, be able to increase the return of the campaign. So to wrap up this presentation, a brief conclusion with some things to keep in mind. Um, to prevent churn in general, we look at two, uh, two perspectives. So company-based, where you make improvements within the company, within the services that you provide, and within the products that you offer um, in order to satisfy your customers and keep them. Um, and customer-based marketing, which means you look at your individual customers or the customers who they associate with um, and their attributes, and you identify those who need your attention, those who are likely to leave, that you can give them additional, uh, yeah, additional offer, additional service, um, additional contact, and hopefully prevent them from leaving. And when you're working with churn prediction, um, always be aware of class skew um, because some models are better at dealing with that than others. And if they are not particularly um, adept at dealing with class skew, there are techniques you can use to, uh, to overcome that. Um, you should consider both customer attributes and their networks. Um, that's, as we learn, there are some situations where the social network is really giving improved prediction um, ability over their, their traditional models using customer attributes. Um, and there are ways to use both. Um, it's, it's, it's a good idea to look at both aspects and see which makes the mo most sense in your cir circumstance. And uh, as I said pre b before, um, interpret interpretability is um, at least as important as accuracy. Of course, you don't want to you don't want to make predictions with an inaccurate model. That doesn't make sense. But um, over over simply accuracy, you want interpretable models, models that are understood by the people using them, that make sense, and that give you insight um, into the reasons why your customers uh, may may be leaving. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind, and um, that concludes this presentation. So uh, thank you very much.